Alright, so today I'm going to be showing you guys three of my own games that I played personally in the Karakan with my several years of experience in this opening with the goal that by the end of this video you guys will be able to play this opening confidently so that when you face the main three lines of this opening you will know what to do and not only that but you will have a constant grounding in the Rising Middle game positions. So let's get right into it. So the first game here we're going to start off with probably one of the most important variations if not the most important variation in the whole of the Karakan which is a classical variation which occurs after knight d3 here. They could also play knight d2 but it's going to transpose after takes takes and bishop f5 here which is a move I recommend. So after takes takes here bishop f5 knight g3 this is the most common move simply retreating knight while also attacking now bishop here bishop g6 and usually what they're going to do, if you don't know already, is they're going to push the h pawn off the board and try and gain some space on the king side, which should aid later in their sort of plan to attack us on the king side. So what we have to do here is play h6 to make sure our bishop does not get trapped and create a hole here on h7. After h5, we have this position here, white's going to play bishop d3, developing, forcing us to exchange our bishop like this. And after e6 here, we have a little bit of a small moment here. White has two small options they can choose between here, bishop d2 and bishop f4. Both of them have a decent amount of fury, but in general we have a lot of the kind of similar ideas in both variations. The problem with bishop f4 though is it doesn't control this diagonal, which means we can play this kind of clever check, queen a5 check, and after bishop d2, we can play this interesting move, bishop b4, and here this is kind of a bit of an interesting moment where white can choose to do a few different things but the main line is c3 kicking the bishop away and this was actually our whole idea it might seem like a bit of a template was to play this whole bishop b4 thing but actually our idea is, is because white has made these kingside pawn moves they don't really want to castle kingside they want to castle queenside and by making them push their c pawn like this we're basically saying that after we retreat our bishop like this now if ever they castle queenside which at the moment they can't really do because otherwise we would just take this pawn and we'd be pretty happy, uh, they kind of have to deal with the fact that they made this weakening move in front of their king. And so that's why the main line is usually c4, trying to kick the queen away, we're going to come back now, and then they castle long. But instead what my opponent did in the game was knight e4, which is kind of a bit slow. I played knight gf6, getting closer to completing my development by simply castling short next, and after knight takes f6 here, knight takes f6, my opponent continues playing b4, trying to kick my queen away, but I'm not scared to see this on the board because after queen d5, c4 once again trying to kick my queen away, we're going to see that a very common idea in the Kara Khan is that we can play this move queen e4, which in this case comes with a check. And okay, the idea is simply that we're forcing a queen exchange here, and now in this position here, white is kind of feeling very awkward. They can't exactly move this bishop, which is being attacked by my knight, because then, like, if they try moving here, for example, they just hang a pawn with check. So they play rook b1 here, I castle, bishop f4 here, moving the bishop out of the attack of the knight here. And this is kind of a position that I really want to discuss. It looks like things might be equal, white right? has a bit of space on the queen side. In fact, I was talking to a friend after the game who saw my game here and he thought my position was pretty bad. Uh, but actually, this is kind of a big misconception that many people might have about this position, just because white has more space. What you have to understand about the Karakhan is initially we're kind of giving white a bit of a space advantage, but later on is where our power really comes in, where we're going to really counter-attack white's kind of pawn center and be able to exploit a bunch of the weaknesses they've created along the way. And that's what we're going to see here after rook fd8, just bringing the rook into the game here, Rook b3, and I should also note that our most common pawn breaks in the Karakhan, especially in the classical variation, is with the c5 break. But in this kind of position here, that's of course very difficult to achieve because of this b4 move. But here, we're going to see a very common idea in the Karakhan. If you want to try and pause the video and figure out what it is, I highly suggest you do so. But with that being said, what I played in the game here was b5. And this looks like a bit of a weird move if you've never seen it before because you might think like isn't this really weakening to the c6 pawn but actually it's not really a big deal after c5 here which my opponent played i should also note that taking here doesn't really do much good because after c takes b5 they don't even have this weakness on c6 to really bank on and anyways what's the real idea of b5 well we're forcing white to essentially come forward with this c pawn here which weakens the d5 square, and this is a really important square in a lot of variations in the Karakhan after we've played b5, 
because we can put a bunch of pieces on that square where they kind of exert tremendous force. For example, a rook that could come to d5 could attack this h5 pawn, a knight on d5 would also be very nice from where it could attack this bishop maybe, this pawn here, there's just so much potential. And here as I mentioned earlier, the c6 pawn is a bit of a weakness and I kind of have to address the fact that knight e5 could be a dangerous threat. So I play bishop f6 first, not only stopping knight e5 basically if he plays knight e5, I'm just going to snap that off, and if he doesn't play knight e5, well I'm just simply threatening to take d4 pawn. And if white tries to defend the d4 pawn here or something like rook d3, now we can really make use of the fact that my opponent played this b4 move earlier which creates a bunch of weaknesses, and also creates a bit of a hook for me to latch onto by playing a5, and now this allows me to open up the a-file which is really bad news for white here, especially since if they play something like a3 we can take take, and now a rook a1 check looks devastating as now I'm going to be winning material here, and you might be thinking hold on rook d1's possible but yeah okay I just take and then go knight takes f2 check, and now I fork these two pieces and black is going to be winning some serious material here. So my opponent was kind of picking that up and so she played rook e3 instead of attacking this knight, but it still doesn't really solve white's problems because after knight g5 here, we're noticing that we're kind of challenging the defender of the d4 pawn which is knight here, and so she didn't want to play knight takes g5, which would kind of give up the defense of the d4 pawn so easily, instead she tried bishop takes g5, now playing g4, stopping me from playing g4, which again would have kicked that knight away from defending d4 pawn. And here I could have taken this pawn here, and you know I would probably be winning here, but instead I decided to go for something much stronger, playing a5, simply just brute forcefully opening up the 8 file like this, trying to make use of different weaknesses, and yeah, this was really just game over at this point for white, she tried playing knight e5, attacking the c6 pawn, but once again I can just chop that guy off, and we get this position here where I could have taken a bunch of pawns, I could have taken the d4, I could have done anything I wanted really, uh, but the game wrapped up pretty quickly here, we had some kind of technical moves, where I essentially am promoting my pawn here, and my opponent played one more move here, rook h1, uh, stopping me from promoting, but after rook b4 here, the d4 pawn is going to be dropping, so she decided she had enough and she just resumed. And so here's the second game we're going to go over, this one was played in the advanced variation, this time we had this line, where instead of playing bishop f5, which is the main line, and is what I usually play, I decided to play c5 in this game, and this was still when I was kind of getting started up in the Karakhan, and I wanted kind of a more simple choice, so I decided to go for the c5 move, which has relatively less fury. Uh, but nevertheless, my opponent here, they didn't play the critical move, which is considered to be d takes c5. And this is what a lot of you guys are going to face as well. You're going to have your opponents play moves like c3, which is kind of relatively more passive and kind of plays into our hands a bit more. Because after knight c6, what we're going to see is when they play this sort of setup for c3, and they don't really challenge us with d takes c5, we're going to get this position here where they allow us to get our bishop outside of the pawn chain and play e6 like this, and now we essentially just have a French advance variation, except our bishop is outside the pawn chain. Which, if many of you don't know, is what is considered to be a good French, and is kind of one of the big appeals of the Karakhan over something like the French defense. So really make sure you kind of understand what's going on in this game, because it's going to pay off big time, because a lot of your opponents are also going to play exactly like how my opponent played in this game here. So after knight bd2 here, we have some normal developing moves, I play knight f5, really taking eye at this d4 pawn here, and my opponent kind of very quickly just messed up here, kind of playing moves like queen a4, not really doing a whole lot. Okay, he's trying to defend this pawn, I get it. But if you have to play a move like queen a4, it feels very artificial. And after c takes d4, already queen b6, my opponent was in big time trouble because he can't really hold onto this d4 pawn because of my bishop here, these knights targeting the pawn. Usually in the French advance, the bishop is all the way back here on c8 and you wouldn't really be winning the pawn here because after something like knight b3 for example, uh, this pawn would be adequately defended. But here in this position that's not the case because after bishop takes f3 takes, knight takes d4 takes, queen takes d4, we simply win a pawn here and this position is amazing for black. So my opponent played rook d1 here, kind of indirectly defending the d4 pawn, so that now if I decide to like take for example, uh, well this stuff doesn't really work so well because after takes takes for example, I'm simply dropping this bishop here, and I can't really take here immediately because now this pawn is adequately defended after takes takes and I can't recapture because of the pin here. So I played bishop e7, just very natural developing move, h3, kicking my bishop away or trying to, 
I'm going to take. I don't want to fall into this kind of trap here with bishop h5, g4, forking these pieces. That's very nasty. Don't fall for that. Bishop takes f3 instead, castles. And here, white has a big dilemma where it's very difficult for them to actually develop here. They're defending the d4 pawn sort of all right, but their pieces are kind of tied down to that. They can't really move any of their pieces. Like, they tried developing this bishop, for example, somewhere like e3. Uh, they're going to run into big trouble here because queen takes b2. And we're just more or less winning the pawn. They can't play rook ab1 trying to attack the queen. Because if you've noticed, the bishop on e2 is simply hanging here. And white is losing big time material. So instead in the game, my opponent just got very impatient here. And tried to kick my knight away with g4. Not really being able to see what to do. However, this is just extremely weakening. And something that you should really try and avoid doing to yourself. Because we're going to see what happens very quickly. Knight h4. We have an exchange of knights here. And once again here, my opponent still faces some troubles here, even after they've tried playing this g4 move, kicking my knight away. They still have to deal with the problem of how to deal with the pressure on this d4 pawn. It's still not easy to address, except now they just have some extra weaknesses around the king. So he tried playing queen b3, trying to get rid of my active queen here, but he simply missed a very elementary tactic here. Knight takes d4, queen takes b6, and knight takes e2 check, intermediate check I must add, and now in this position here, Black is up an extra pawn, and after f6 here, I'm opening up the position, really exploiting the fact that white's kind of king shelter feels very weak, and if I'm able to simply just grab this f2 pawn, that'd be very nice. In the game, however, I decided not to even play rook takes f6 targeting this pawn, I just decided to keep white's pieces tied down here, now not allowing them to move this bishop here, it's simply tied down to defending this pawn, they can't move the rook, then trying to develop the bishop, because simply a2 would hang, and they can't move like this pawn or something because well simply the rook hangs so you can really see the big predicament that my opponent had he tried playing a3 first which makes sense because he saw in some lines they might want to play rook b1 then develop the bishop because b2 but they want to defend that but this still doesn't solve their problems rook a c8 simply just switch over with the rook here bring it to the c file instead and some big problems that my opponent had to solve which they couldn't really do in the game after bishop e3 here Trying to simply counter-attack my pawn here, and just not caring if I take this. Uh, I decide that's okay though, that I can play bishop f4, offer an exchange of bishops. And here we saw the game conclude very quickly, uh, in a rather hasty fashion here, with my opponent taking on c8, not a move they should have played. If you haven't seen my video on keeping the tension, this is definitely a very important concept you must understand. Here my opponent released the tension here, they should have kept it with a move like king takes e3. Because now after rook takes c8, they allow my rook to get very easy control over this file. And after rook c2 here, uh, my opponent had to very, play very passively like this. And they allowed me to get my king in. And after king f5 here, things came to an end pretty soon as my king is on a very active square. Whereas my opponent's pieces are all just passive and stuck defending different pawns. So uh, h4 happened, rook c4. Rook f1 once again defending the pawn, but after rook e4 check, it was time to call it a day because... Uh, I'm forking the king and well, a bunch of pawns here. The king has to move somewhere and eventually this pawn's going to drop. So my opponent just resigned here. Alright, so this is the final game for today. We're going to be looking at the exchange variation in this game. This is another one of the most common variations in the Karakhan. And in this game, we're going to see once again the bishop come out to g4. Put an annoying pin on this knight here. And this is a very unpleasant thing that white has to deal with. The most accurate way to play the exchange variation actually avoid this all by simply playing bishop d3 here and delaying the development of this knight so it's not easy for white to simply well, sorry for black to simply play bishop g4 like in this position here of course we play bishop g4 then just take it so that means we have to try and play tricky weight moves like queen c7 for example to hope white plays knight f3 but then white can also play stuff like a3 to stop bishop g4 and there's a whole bunch of theory i'm not going to get into too much detail right now instead i really want you guys to see the kind of important ideas here of bishop g4 and we're going to see some very kind of typical plans which a lot of people when they play with white are going to allow us to play so bishop f4 happens e6 more of kind of just normal developing moves Offering an exchange of bishops here, and here we kind of see one of the most important moments of the game, which is kind of where we decide what our plan is going to be now that we've finished our basic development and the opening is over. And if you guys don't know, this is called the card bad pawn structure, but we have these kind of pawns against these pawns aiming this way, and our pawns are aiming this way. It often arises out of the Queen's Gambit Decline Exchange variation, if you know that. 
I've discussed that in some other videos as well. Basically here, we have this position where black has a bunch of different plans, but there's kind of one main plan that you want to try and aim for if you can. And that's what we call the minority attack, where because our pawn structure is aiming this way, we kind of want to try and play in this side of the board. And if we play this move rook a b8 here and aim for his pawn with kind of b5 and b4, this is what we'd call the minority attack, simply trying to undermine white's pawn structure on this side of the board, hoping that after something like b5, b4 taking on c3, that pawn will be a long term weakness that we can really hone in on and target. So when my opponent plays rook f1, a very kind of natural move, and here it might not look like I can play b5 because white can take it. But if you look a bit closely, because of this pin here, I can simply play something like a6, and I'm able to win material because of this pin on the queen here. So, my opponent played a3 in the game, and this is a bit of a tricky moment, because after a3 is being played, it doesn't seem so simple to simply get in b4 as we want to. And here you also have to be a bit careful, because usually the most common way to go about this is to play a5 here, and try and reinforce the minority attack this way by playing b4 next, and it's very difficult to stop, except in this exact situation, it's a little bit dangerous because white can actually probably just take here, and if you notice, our pawn, well, pawns can't move backwards, right? So, I can't play a6 and simply kick this bishop away, and if I try to play something like knight a7 here to target the bishop, they can play a4, back the bishop this way up, and, um, yeah, I think white's just going to be a pawn up here, so we should probably avoid this if we can. And that's why in the game I played knight a5, which is another very typical idea, and after queen c2, I can put my knight on this nice outpost here on c4, and now I can aim to get in a5, b4, now that my b5 pawn is guarded very safely. So my opponent actually tried playing this move b4, which is kind of a bit more of an advanced idea to stop me from playing a5 and b4 by simply occupying the b4 square on their own. But I decided to play a5 anyway here, with my idea simply being I'm going to try open this up, or put a rook on the c file and try and target the c3 pawn. I'm not exactly sure yet, but I have to be sure and aware of white's plan to maybe play something like knight b3 and throw the knight in there, which they actually played right now. But the reason this isn't so good is because this knight was playing a very important role on d2, defending the knight on f3. But now the problem is I can play bishop takes f3, double their kingside pawns, and now the kingside structure is in a very kind of weird situation, which I was already able to kind of exploit here by playing a4 and putting my queen f4, simply targeting this f3 pawn, and already white was just a lot worse. And I'm not going to go over the rest of the game in too much detail, especially since this was a blitz game unlike the other two games, so I kind of screwed things up a bit around this point, but up until this point, all of my moves have been very kind of consistent and logical, and you've kind of seen the most important plan. So takes, takes is played, and here king g2 happened to defend this pawn, but because of this move d takes c4 here, now this opens up the d5 square. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, a very important square, very often in a lot of the Kara Khan variations, and I'm able to bring my rook to the square, lift it up here, all sorts of dangerous ideas, and I think we should wrap things up around here. I had a clear advantage, my opponent kind of hung on a bit. Uh, I was able to kick it around, this night by playing moves like h5, h4, uh, and I had a very good position, but things got a bit messy and time trouble here. But nevertheless, if you kind of follow this sort of blueprint here, by playing the minority attack with b5 and a5 and b4, you're going to be able to get very good positions a lot of the time. Alright, so that just about wraps things up for this video. If you liked it, please like the video, and also subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And if you'd like to see more content on this opening, also let me know. But anyways, until next time, I will see you guys.